Uh, thank you. Um, it's nice to hear Warwick and everyone else has spoken today. Unfortunately, um, I brought a whole 30 pages of uh, information that's already been talked about. So, <laughs> uh, um, what I want to do, you know, I can't express enough the uh, comments that have been made and, um, you know, how they've been sort of uh, put out to us. Um, interesting about the comments in relation, to, in relation to the Family Violence Death Review Committee because one of the things I had here was to read a paragraph out of that, and um, but you stole that as well. So, <laughs> um, so I appreciate that. So I guess I want to um, come from a real grassroots point of view. Um, I just introduced myself a little bit. Um, I spent um, 10 years running a family home for child death and family. Uh, looked after over two and a half thousand young people and pretty much with that their families. Um, I was a residential uh, a social worker at uh, Kinsey Residential in the old facility. Um, I spent um, the last 17 years in police youth development uh, with high offending young people and their families um, and for the last 17 years also. This is all sort of uh, at the same time I guess. Um, I run a um, trust uh, for uh, high offending youth and, um, and, we're, and part of that uh, concept is to engage with their families at the same time because you can't work with one without the other. Um, I also uh, authored the Father-Son Army based programs uh, to get fathers involved with their um, displaced uh, sons. Uh, which I ran for seven years at Burnham Army Camp uh, with over 370 um, fathers that came to that and um, you know creating awareness around um, what's available and what's not available uh, and it's already been indicated today many times um, you know what is available or not available for men. And just a point on that we did a 12 month uh, follow up on those families each time every year we ran it we spent the next 12 months following up with those same families. Um, but one of the things we used to do is, we'd, we'd, one of the uh, criteria was asking what resources did you know about that are available for men? And 100% of those men had no idea you know, where to go, uh, what to ask for, how to ask for it, and the fear of asking in the first place. And I reflect back on the word shame was um, a lot of the stuff that came out at the end of those programs. I'm still going to read the, uh, the paragraph that I um, took out of the Family Violence Death Review Committee um, because it goes along with some of the things that have been said and I quite was interested in the words they used. So I'm just going to read it out and it says, whilst the majority of those who commit a family violence homicide have been the ab abuser, predominant aggressor in brackets, this is a quote from it, in the history of the relationship this is not always so. In small subset of cases the committee found that the person who committed homicide was in fact the primary victim and the deceased was the predominant aggressor. In order to the prevention focused, uh, sorry, in order to be prevention focused, all levels of family violence response systems need to determine who the IPV predominant aggressor and IPV primary victim are. So I'm just probably reinforcing what you're saying. Regardless of who has used physical force on any particular occasion, this is necessary so that the primary victims can be identified and effectively supported before serious harm or fertility occurs. Identifying primary victim can also interpret repeat victimisation and ensure predominant aggressor is held accountable. And interestingly enough that we've, we've talked about PSOs, uh, police safety orders, sorry, and um, the services. Now, my time in the police, I went to many uh, domestic incidences and I was in the police when the PSOs first came out. Now, I'm going to lead on to it very quickly in my next part, but in all those incidents of domestic violence, the information gathered was on the perpetrator and identifying immediately who the perpetrator was, which was predominantly male. However, in a few cases, the uh, perpetrator was the female who remained in the home and the guy was asked to leave the home because he had a mate who would look after him. The consequences of that led to significant issues in court hearings, protection orders being issued, um, and so forth, and immediately uh, you do that as a male, you become uh, put in a position where you have to then defend yourself 
on why you're not the perpetrator, and you're never going to be heard as a victim. It just the door closes on you and is shut. So today I wanted to sort of uh, you know have some questions out there, you know, around the family violence. You know, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? You know, men getting over their egos and or and I'm going to change that word now to shame and actually start asking the questions and get into groups and actually um, you know, challenge each other in a robust way on how we can move forward to the suggestions that have already been made. But what I want to do is, um, I'm going to refer to some of my pages here because um, the Family Violence Clearinghouse came out with some statistics that said 91% of offences of male uh, perpetrators and 9% um, were female under the um, charges of uh, section 194 and 196 of the Crimes Act. I'm going to read the two Crimes Act to you. 1961 Crimes Act, section 194, being a male, uh, sorry, being assault on a child or by a male on a female uh, with a sentencing year period of two years imprisonment. And section 196 is a um, charge of a, um, is where a female commits an assault, which is common assault. Now the reason I sort of brought it up was because in the police they have a thing called a pre-charge, um, a pre-clause charge, which is a, doc, a, a book that they follow on um, and actually go on to put a specific charge on a uh, male. And that comes under 1543, which is male assaults female manually. Um, and 1593, is a common assault which women are charged under. Now, the significance of this is that when you look at the clearinghouse statistics, every single one of those categories was based on male assaults female. How do you get a statistic when you don't have a reciprocal charge to actually come up with a proper outcome for who is the defend uh, or who the perpetrator is? And how do you define the amount of? Now, there's five categories um, on um, the charges, which is with a weapon, uh, manually, what sort of physical nature of that, and um, there's one other, I can't remember, fighting the firearm would be the other thing. So the problem I have is when you have such a, an indifference in law, and then at the moment it's already been indicated that there's going to be added charge to that, which now they're looking at strangulation being added to um, 15, uh, 1543 of male assaults female. So we're going to continue to build a um, huge area of um, policing men without reciprocating the same amount yes. for um, charging women for the same offences. I've been involved in a lot of uh, violent uh, situations and um, it just becomes you know, more um, inappropriate. I want to just sort of, Dr Leslie Campbell, 2014, uh, reach out men's community outreach, service connections and conversations with a purpose of evaluation of a pilot. This is focused on male perpetrators. If you go into Aviva and read their information, it's all good. It started a um, it started a process for uh, men as uh, perpetrators, but it doesn't have anything about men as victims. It is all focused on men being a perpetrator. Again, we are sort of <clears throat> building ourselves under an umbrella where we actually don't get a voice to say, "Well, hold on a minute." How am I going to get listened to if I have to fit into this particular category? So I guess I've got lots of things here, but I'd rather be around when you go into groups and talk about things so that they can actually be challenged in a more um, practical manner. Um, <clears throat> I just want to sort of finish off, and like uh, Louise, I'm terrified of that buzzer going, so I want to try and get, flip my gums quick so, uh, a lot sooner. Um, someone mentioned a uh, woman's affairs spokesman, Sue Maroney. She came out and uh, she did make a comment that I actually quite liked. Um, and that was that um, the police must resume reporting full family violence statistics so we can get the full picture. Now full family violence statistics just doesn't mean you read a poll 400 and take the statistic. Because when I talk about those pre-charge um, offences that the police have for men, there has been no research done on those pre-charges. None. 
So I am always bemused when I read 95% of them this, 75% of them that. How did they get there? How did any researcher get there? Now, I always indicated that um, there's very little research in New Zealand. So I'm always bemused. Now, coming to this, I was really nervous. I'm a grassroots guy. I'm outspoken, a bit like our friends. And um, sometimes we get entrapped and we get called conspirators and all those sort of things. But we struggle to get a voice across because we come across as we're aggressive. We get called passionate because we're not told we're aggressive, but because we're passionate. But um, so for me, it's about getting away from our the men's biggest resource, and I want to finish on our biggest resource is our prisons. You know, we trap men in a concrete wall and say, "Shut up," because I don't want to know. You'll do your time, come out, and reoffend again, and reoffend again, and not have any part of what it feels like to be in a family, because that is and becomes their only family. So I want to thank everyone. Nut it out and let's come up with some solutions. And again, thank you for uh, our MPs being here. Appreciate it. Thank you.